Hello, uh, welcome back uh, to the Authentic Caribbean Rum uh, Hangouts, uh, where we like to talk about, um, obviously, rum uh, and Authentic Caribbean Rum, uh, to be more specific. Um, as always, I'm joined by a selection of our uh, fine uh, international panel members, uh, spirits experts from around the world. Um, uh, I'll start uh, with, uh, sorry, I'm getting hangouts. some... Uh, where feedback like here, I'm going to have to talk about, um, obviously, rum, wait, wait a uh, and authentic Caribbean rum, uh, to be more Can you hear me? Yes. yes. You both. Selection of our, uh, okay. Sorry about that. We had some sound issues uh, here in, in Spain. Um, can you hear me okay? I had some feedback, and it was a bit... Uh, yeah, okay. Yeah? Sorry about that. So, again... Uh, joined by panel members from around the world, I'll start with uh, the lovely lady in the middle, uh, Daniela Tatarin in Vancouver. Everything okay, Dani? Sí, I'm actually in Mexico right now. Oh, yes. Even better. Yeah. I thought it was a bit. Uh, it was a bit summery for Vancouver, but <laughs> yeah, it's quite hot here. It's very, very hot. <laughs> Well, thank you. Thank you for joining us, as usual. Um, next, to, next to Danny, we have Dan. Uh, and I assume you're in Milan. You're not uh, in a different place? Or Genoa? Well, yeah, I'm in Genoa because tomorrow the, the, the Navy party will be Genoa. So. Well, thank yeah. you for joining us again. Yeah. Biondi, Mr. Rum uh, Italia. Thank you. And last but not least, uh, Peter. Uh, I guess you're in Chicago, but I might be wrong as well. I, I am in Chicago. I'm always, I'm always rounding out uh, last but not least, but I'm in Chicago. I'm actually at Tenzing where we held the uh, first ACR uh, event here. Excellent. So the, the topic for today uh, is uh, aging and uh, age statements and uh, the importance of giving, obviously, true age statements and um, uh, whether or not it's an indication of quality in, in rum. But I'd like to start off with uh, just your general uh, perspective. You know, we, we I'm, I'm sure you all know, but uh, some people don't actually realize the difference between tropical aging and regular aging. So I'd like to start off just with your general uh, thoughts on aging in general, what it adds to a spirit and and what it adds to rum specifically. So I'll start with, with Danny in Mexico. Um, yeah, so I mean aging for me um, is the interaction with the spirit and the barrel and depending on what type of climate you're in, the, the barrel and the spirit and the air um, outside are all going to um, interact cause interactions uh, that are going to be different no matter where you are. So things like altitude, humidity, um, temperature are going to affect the, the way that the spirit is interacting with the barrel and that is going to either cause it to age slower or um, expedite the process of the interaction of the barrel and the spirit and also I guess the angel share that escapes the barrel as well. So depending on the humidity, I mean, right now I'm sitting here in in Mexico and the humidity is about 90% and it's plus 33. So if I was a barrel, the the temperature and the humidity would and would be a lot different than if I was a barrel somewhere somewhere that's a lot colder and and drier. Um, there would be more air air interaction and uh, the the wood I guess in the barrel would be uh, less I get I don't know if the technical term would be less dense and less um, uh, affected from the inside and the outside so um, I guess my my view of it is that the the magic of of aging and the effect of uh, the barrel and the spirit interaction it, it really um, you can tell that, you know, if you are spending a lot of time and the angel share is 
being is is less affected by by the temperature and humidity, then uh, it's going to take longer for the the spirit to age and the effect of, of that um, interaction between the barrel and and the air and the spirit is is going to happen less less quickly so I mean um, yeah just looking at different climates uh, different altitudes everything's going to have a, a different effect on that that interaction and that that magic that happens there so um, yeah no thanks so is there a is there a an advantage to say tropical or uh, cooler aging or um, altitude aging, uh, Peter. What, what do you think? I don't know if I necessarily consider it uh, an advantage. I think that what Daniel is getting at is there's we can't just look at aging as a blanket statement. There's so many things that go into it. Uh, where even if you want to get so specific, where in the warehouse is that barrel? But a little bit more macro, you know, where what is that barrel next to? What is the warehouse next to? Um, uh, and I think it goes beyond. And I think it's just how that master blender does his job um, with the environment he has to work with, and um, that's really the art we have to look at here. Not necessarily where it's aged, but or um, what that master blender does with that spirit once it is aged, and how do they blend it together? I see because. Um, age is is uh, sort of very. I'm gonna I'm gonna go to Dan because I know he's gonna like this question because he likes his raw spirits. So, what, what do you think it, aging adds, and is it a, a, a you know is it equivalent to quality, and what qualities does it bring to a spirit, and why do you think it's so important? And brands like to put numbers on their on their bottles. Yeah. Well, um, what is sure, in my opinion, is that aging is for sure not only the not the the, the only one uh, phase of the process that gives the, the value of or, or the quality of the rum of the final product, but uh, is for sure very important. And uh, um, what the the consumer, at, at least here in Europe. What the consumer um, understand of the value is uh, the long aging because we are a uh, producer of cognac or, or whiskey and so we are used to very long aging and a very high number on, on labels of course and uh, so um, it, till uh, no more than five years ago also with the help of, of uh, Authentic Caribbean Rum, the program, uh, we, we did a lot of uh, uh, seminars on that, on the tropical aging uh, in relationship with uh, the, the continental aging of, of whiskey and cognac uh, in the last years. But before, um, the, 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 the highest the number, no, the, the better the, the quality. And so this is a big, big misunderstanding because um, the aging is important, but is uh, is uh, important also the, the raw material, all the fermentation, all the distillation, and so uh, is is uh, interesting to compare to rum when uh, when are aged uh, zero, so white, of course, uh, and then is uh, is also important to understand the the aging. Um, there is a great interest, you know, in the last in the last years in uh, in rum aged in continental weather. Because um, in Italy also uh, there are a lot of new new labels, new brands uh, that are that started to have uh, um, in the portfolio some some rum aged in uh, in continental weather, maybe in uh, in UK or in Scotland or in France, and so sometimes it's a second aging, uh, so the first part of the of the of their life spent in uh, in the Caribbean. And the second part in uh, in Europe, uh, but many times our um, boat is rum. Our boats when are fresh in uh, in the Caribbean, so white, and all their life are is, is spent in uh, in, uh, in the continental weather, and uh, the the number of the, the real uh, anagraphic. I don't know if is a is a is a word that you can understand. The, the anagraphic age. Uh, is uh, is maybe is ten, is eight, is twelve, but at the end is completely completely different. 
10 years in uh, Europe and 10 years spent in a barrel in, uh, in the Caribbean. Uh, just to understand that one number, uh, normally whiskey or cognac lose uh, 2% uh, is what they call the, the angel share. Uh, in the Caribbean, the, the annual evaporation in average is uh, 8 to 10. Uh, you know, I work also with some, some producer in the Caribbean and uh, uh, trading with barrels in the Caribbean. And uh, sometimes, uh, as last year, um, uh, um, we, we monitored some losses of 12%. And so angels in the Caribbean are, are more thirsty, I think, maybe some pi pirates, not, not only angels there. And uh, this is very important to understand the final uh, maturation of, a, of, of the spirit uh, and also the value, of course, because at the end, if you lose uh, in 10 years, you, uh, you open the barrel and you have less than 40 or 50% of the initial contents. So also to understand the, uh, the value. Uh, is very important. Yeah, obviously the the as Danny was saying in the beginning, the the humidity and the heat in the Caribbean is a, an important factor because it speeds up the process. And I've heard from a lot of producers that uh, from I don't know fifteen to twenty years, you know, it's it's important to to stop the, the aging process sometimes because you don't get a lot out of it, you're losing rum, and then you might even have uh, overpowering flavors from the barrel. So what are the ways in which you can find that balance that in your experience what do you, and, and speaking to producers? Sorry, Danny, yeah, Danny, um, Danny, Mexico. <laughs> okay. Um. Sorry, repeat the question. Uh, so we're talking about when, like, how the producers are are monitoring when they're taking the product out of the barrels and and what other factors that they're looking at. Yeah. 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 So I mean, obviously, they're looking at the angel share because the value of the product that's that's being taken from the angels and being lost to to the angel share is a, a big big factor. But also, I mean. Um, they might want to change the barrels from, uh, say, uh, an ex bourbon barrel to uh, an ex sherry barrel to to do the finishing. I know that um, at at Foursquare, uh, Richard Seals, you know, been experimenting with a lot of different finishing in barrels, and um, I mean, you're looking at maybe like four years in one barrel and and two two years finishing in another barrel to get a different effect of. Of that, um, of the f the finalizing the flavors that are going to come from the barrel. So when we're talking about aging and um, and finding that sweet spot of of the the t the taste and the flavor that you're getting from the barrel, and then also having a happy medium of the amount that you 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 are, is the maximum that you want to lose. Um, it's kind of like a fine balance, and depends on. Like um, Peter said, what the the master blender is looking for in the final product, and the I guess the economics of of knowing when to to say, okay, this is the this is how I want it to taste, but also this is the value of the rum, and we're not we don't want to go past this point. Right. Yeah. I mean, you, you mentioned the word value, and 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 Dan spoke about. You know, it's important to understand the amount of rum that is lost in the aging process to understand the value. Uh, and he also mentioned the, the age statement uh, as, as a, an equivalent of quality here in Europe. Uh, is that the case in the US, Peter? Do you find that just the number in itself sells? And, and how can brands, you know, communicate the importance of aging but not so the only factor that, that brings quality into the picture. Is, this, is that the case in the US as well, where numbers speak for themselves? Uh, uh, let's see. Am I unmuted here? Yeah. A hundred percent. You know, we, when we do tastings or even customers at the bar, want to, that number speaks a lot. And it, it, um, it's usually the first thing people look at. Um, it's in their heads as a 
quality statement for some reason, even though we know it, uh, it's not necessarily a statement of quality. Um, but it does command a price too, um, especially with Chicago here where we're so bourbon heavy, uh, so whiskey heavy that um, people do seek out these bourbons that, you know, you, you you reach a certain point of diminishing returns if you've aged them too far, but you have no choice but to bottle them and, and slap an age statement on there and luckily enough people will pay for it. Um, but uh, interestingly, I had a, a meeting yesterday with one of the national ambassadors from McAllen who was telling me at least in Europe they're starting to move away from numbered age statements and they're going towards more of a... Um, uh, just sort of a feel. Uh, they're, they're labeling by different um, uh, names. I think they're going to go to a color statement uh, on their bottles, but they're, uh, they have these different age. What is this kind of, what are the characteristics of this scotch and what does that uh, exhibit, can exhibit? And they're starting to release those in the U.S. too. So you even see it with um, some of the producers starting to move away from the age statements to you know, I think to do some more interesting things with their with their with their spirits and not be attached to an age statement. Yeah, because the the thing with aging, you, you I mean, you, you spoke about uh, the difference between the Caribbean and the continental um, aging. So, mm -hmm. you know, ten years in Europe is not the same as ten years in the Caribbean. For sure. So, how and and you know, there, there's even. Uh, more complex um, sort of variables as with Solera system. So, uh, Daniele, if you can explain what Solera system is and why it's important to to explain why that can be confusing for consumers and why it's important to have um, yeah. the correct number on the bottle. Yeah, I can explain easily what Solera system was, and uh, because it was. Um, a very noble, let me say, a very noble uh, way to age, um, took from the from the from the sherry tradition. And what is interesting is that um, is is a way to do aging and blending at the same time to have a, the final product 100% um, balanced. Because if you if you do the aging together with a, con a continued uh, movement or on on the uh, the liquid, the the, the age ram uh, through the barrels, at the end you have a, a final product that is really uh, balanced and, and complex and balanced. Um, normally, the the misunderstanding is that if you if you do a solera aging. Uh, putting a number on the label is is a, is a nonsense because uh, the Solera system means that uh, the the younger part of the of the rum you have in the in the bottle is the is the maybe three or four years so it, it depends when uh, it depends the the oldest rum you you put in the in the pyramid you know the system and the oldest rum the oldest drop in this in this uh, final blend is uh, uh, its age is the is the age of when you started this pyramid this system, and so let me say um, in the past before this great interest on, on the on the numbers on labels there was some solera rum that uh, declared uh, I am a blend of uh, from four years let me say to thirty five years. Because it me it means uh, I started 35 years the pyramid, and uh, my pyramid is of four, four floor, four uh, levels. Four. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, so putting a number is is a, is nonsense. Some some of them started to say, uh, okay, maybe from four to 35 means 20, <laughs> which mean which means nothing. And um, the, the most important thing of Solera is that it's is really not possible to declare an age because for the rules, for the rules of whiskey, of cognac, but also of rum uh, shared by, by uh, European Union and, and the Caribbean itself, um, you should al always put the youngest part of the blend on, on the label. And so, um, it, Writing twenty, the average writing a number that means nothing is is uh, is uh, out of the rules. Um, 
let me say ju just one thing. Normally, a uh, producer uh, that aged completely in the Caribbean, um, always they try to find a balance between um, the, the 8 10% of, of, uh, of angel share and uh, uh, the, the value and also the balance of the liquid but also the value they have to put in the market because if you if you wait a lot at the end you don't you don't have any product at the end and it's easy to understand because uh, in the if you if you look at rum of the 60s of the 50s also uh, they were normally aged no more than 6 to 7 years if you if you look at very old bottles uh, so the the normal balance uh, of a rum can also be six or seven. You can have a very old rums, which more, is more or less the twenty years for a whiskey. So not bad. Uh, but in the last years, of course, the uh, the interest of the on this number uh, made all the producer to 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 get higher to get higher the this, this number because. The, the consumer recognizes the number more or less as a vote uh, when uh, 20 years is better than 15 and better than 12 or better than 10 you know? <laughs> like you know in the university you know? yeah. <laughs> and this is and this is not is not is not good uh, also because uh, um, it's easy to understand that if you lose 10 percent per year after 20 years the, the barrel is empty and so you can have run of 20 years old uh, but very very small very small quantity and very high price and so normally I don't believe in in uh, rums or in brands that uh, declare 20 or whatever and they do millions bottles because uh, where what are these barrels that's the question if you if you um, I don't want to reduce to a uh, algebra but it's easy uh, if you make a comparison between uh, the number of barrels they have in the stock and uh, uh, the volumes they do of uh, these uh, 10 years old run or 20 years old run because uh, somewhere this run uh, uh, is supposed to age and so uh, if they declare uh, 100,000 bottles or 1 million bottles of a 10 years old they, they should have uh, thousand and thousand or hundred thousand barrels and uh, so uh, if they don't if they don't have these, these amounts of barrels maybe sometimes some, something is not is not correct is not real understand yeah I, I completely understand it and that's one of the reasons behind um, the education factor of the authentic Caribbean rum mark and the campaign behind it um, as you were saying the there are some rules to the way rum is produced uh, in the Caribbean. Un information you know so my question is to you guys Danny in Mexico is how thirsty are consumers to know the truth about products and in that sense how important you think it is for these sort of um, uh, rules and regulations i.e. the youngest rock in the blend for example you totally cut out there for uh, all I got was the last end of what you said in the bottle. <laughs> uh, okay. So I missed. I, I missed it. Um, oh. No. So I was asking. I was asking about the importance of rules and regulations, and and one of them being the minimum age statement. But my question is, how important is that to consumers? Is that relevant, or does the consumer not care? What is your experience 
in your bar in Vancouver, in Mexico? Do consumers really want to know the truth behind the product? Um, I think that yeah, they they do. They um, they want to know about you know what goes into making it and um, what what the difference is between say a uh, rum that has five years on the barrel or bottle and and ten years on the bottle and what the difference is. Um, you know, one of those might cost more, but the both of those rums are going to taste different depending on uh, the mark that they're coming from. So. If someone's paying more for a ten-year-old rum than a five-year-old rum, I think they're going to want to know what what the difference is—a five-year-old or a ten-year-old, or a bottle that has no age on it. Mm. Um, so it's definitely important to to be able to explain to someone, you know, why there's no age on the barrel or why or bottle, sorry, and why there is um, X age on the bottle, or you know. Something that says Solera on the bottle. Mm -hmm. um, so any any time people are paying more for a product, they're going to want to know, you know, why they're paying more and and what the difference is and how the process of making that happens. So to be able to have rules that say um, you can't put a number on the bottle without that. Um, the spirit being aged for the minimum of, of the year on the bottle, then I think that clarifies it for a lot of people to, to know why they're, why they're paying more. If it's a 10-year um, bottle and to know that no rum going into that bottle uh, of the blend is, is less than 10 years, is, it automatically kind of explains to them why that rum is going to cost more than something that has a five-year age statement on it. Yeah, uh, obviously the, the, the justification of a price is a key driver, um, but my, I, I'm, I'm also interested in knowing uh, if that is a trend uh, that you see in the US, in Chicago specifically, in pizza, uh, from consumers, or does their interest sort of... Uh, stop at the age, they're just interested in the number, they're not interested in the whole story. I think, uh, can you hear me, Peter? Uh, you're cutting in and out, but I think I got most of the question there, and I just want to add to what uh, Danielle was saying, that it, it, is, it is a good, um, uh, it's a great thought that having no age statement almost throws up uh, more red flags for consumers than having an age statement on there, and, and there might need to be another way to uh, whether it's a, you know, something like the, the VSOP system, for example, some other way of demarcating um, uh, age or, or aging or blending rather than just one stamp. Um, but having nothing on there, I know, sometimes throws up more red flags for consumers. Um, and to, other, to touch on your earlier question about um, what trends are consumers looking at here in the U.S. and what are they asking about, we're going through an interesting time in bourbon um, in the U.S. where people are realizing that oh, their bourbon's not necessarily made where they thought it was made, and we're seeing a lot of bourbon companies start to get sued right now, and there's a class action suit against a few of um, a few of these whiskey makers in the U.S. that are being settled right now. But um, unfortunately, what, uh, what's happening is a lot of consumers don't realize that this has been the tradition of producing these spirits um, for their entire history, and now they're trying to reshape what, the, what those laws are in their own minds and then taking these companies to court falsely. Um, so it's interesting as consumers start to get more educated about spirits, they don't always understand the history of why things have been done. Um, you know, one that might come up with rum is the addition of caramel coloring. Uh, first of all, people might say, why, why in the world would you add caramel coloring to rum? Well, then that's always been the history of rum to adjust for, for color, for consistency. But when consumers hear, hear something like that, it might take them, uh, take them aback initially. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because we've been talking about the perception of the number as as the easiest way to communicate quality, but we were, you know, Dan explained the you know the, the difficulty of, of uh, understanding some of the numbers on the bottom and maybe a few numbers that are questionable. So my final question is, what can Rum do to communicate quality? without a number on the age. Uh, um, Dan, I don't know if you heard that question fully. So what can one do, uh, apart, yeah, yeah. apart from the rules of minimum aging, uh, 
what can it do to communicate quality in that uh, case that uh, Peter was saying that when you don't show a number, you know, yeah. questions arise. Yes, it's a very good question. <laughs> and <laughs> yeah, who has the answer uh, win, you know? <laughs> what, what, uh, if you look at whiskey, uh, in the last uh, in the last years, the the I mean Scotch whiskey, uh, the, the increase in interest and increasing volumes. Um, um, how can I say? Uh, increases the volume and so decrease the stock, and so some some producer also some of the best and the more the well known producer um, started to delete this number on, on, on labels because they started with the, the fashion of no age rums. So they changed um, the, the interest from the number, the old number uh, on labels to uh, the, the art of blending because um, they finished the old rums. And so uh, some of the producer uh, changed completely the, the strategy. And uh, there are a lot of new uh, interests on finishing. So this is another uh, trend. So the value is the finish in uh, Sauterne or in Madeira or in Port Casks. And um, this allows to uh, give value without a base of very old rum. And this is very, it's the last trend in the last years, also in rum. Uh, the problem is that no one uh, really talk about the quality of the wood. Uh, no one talk about, there is, there is al always, I mean, a, a, a dark side, you know, of the value, let me say. And uh, um, what Trump can do, in my opinion, uh, is to uh, not, not be so obsessed or, or stressed on old aging and uh, communicate itself like a rum. And not a whiskey, and not a cognac. If you if you think um, to all, old rums till uh, 20, 30 years ago, so it's always before this marketing obsession of this number, um, rums were, were were younger, and uh, uh, because are produced in the in the Caribbean colonies or ex colonies. Uh, all the, the the rules were made by by uh, French, let me say, for for Martinique or Guadeloupe, or uh, f made by whiskey society. So the same rules was applied to the rum, um, and rum is not whiskey. Rum is not cognac, so it is a completely different uh, spirit, aged in in a completely different weather. Uh, if you consider uh, cognac, for example, VSOP, as, as Peter was saying, uh, is uh, the, the VO, VSOP, XO, this cluster of aging is from zero to uh, six months, from six months to three years and a half till uh, six years and a half. All these, uh, these clusters are easy to apply to a, a continental spirit, not to a, to a tropical spirit, but is in some way the, the protection, the protective strategy of the, of the uh, European spirit that uh, applied to the, to the, to the tropics. Uh, so the value can be uh, good spirits, not not necessarily aged uh, 20 years, because is sometimes is not is not possible, and uh, so turning the interest to the to the raw material, to some agricultural rum, for example, they started finally to speak about the raw material, so the variety of sugarcane. Uh, no one talk about the fermentation, unfortunately, because it's not it's not really really easy to communicate to the consumer. So the, the length of fermentation, the yeasts are not really appealing uh, contents, let me say. Um, the distillation is, uh, is a bit more uh, important on, on labels, on descriptions, on the brochure, let me say. 
um, so the kind of distillation, the pot steel distillation rather than column steel or something like this, there's an increase in interest on that. So uh, not, not only the aging um, is, is, is a good question because uh, the question is how RAM can declare the truth with the lowest number, no? continuing to have a, a value. And so it's a, it's, a, it's a very difficult question, you're right. Yeah, so I know, and, and that's what everyone's trying to find out. What, I, and I'll thank you, Dan. What, what do you think, Dan? Can, I mean, what can, I mean, apart from all the stuff that Dan has said, what do you think that rum as a spirit from the Caribbean can do? Uh, I think that Dan had touched on some really important things that um, that can, I think, be highlighted a lot more as the, the production steps before the rum goes into the barrel and how that um, creates a, a different flavor. I mean, if you're comparing it to a spirit like tequila or mezcal, um, people who are interested in learning about that are really interested in learning about uh, how long it's fermented, whether or not it's a natural yeast or what type of yeast they're using, what type of still, is it a clay pot still, it is a copper pot still, um, you know, with rum are they blending a column or blending a, blending a pot or is it one of the other and, and I mean the flavors that come from all of those different factors from the type of cane, the altitude and the terroir of, of, of the, the raw materials and then also the, the fermentation and the distillation should, I mean, for me, if we're talking about the barrel as well and aging, all of those steps right before you get into the barrel are going to create the flavor that's going to be the base for the, the interaction with the wood and, and to kind of maybe highlight some of those, well, maybe those steps will help people to understand the value of the spirit before it goes into the barrel and what it tastes like. Um, exactly. I mean, for me to to taste an unaged rum from the same mark and to taste the aged rum from from uh, the same mark and to, to taste that the difference of what the, the raw spirit is and then what, what it tastes like after it's been aged is a really, it's, it's a great indication of what the what they're working with and and how sometimes the that spirit is maybe even more beautiful than um, how it comes out of the barrel. So, um, so there can be real real value in in highlighting all those steps before the the last step of the barrel and the blending. Yeah. So you guys have touched on on you said a word which is education. So it's really about showcasing not just one aspect or the final aspect of the process but all of the process, right? So consumer education is key. Is that, is that really correct? For sure. Yeah, exactly. May, may I add one, one thing, Jacobo? Yeah. You know, you know, we share many times, I'm a big fan of white trams, but not um, for some reason. The first is that um, I love so much ram, and, and in the last years I've I saw, unfortunately, a lot of uh, uh, numbers on label that are not, not true. That's the, the, the point of today. And uh, I'm turning my, my attention you know, to, to white rums because um, the raw material, the fermentation, the distillation, so before the aging, uh, the other phases are not really uh, discovered by, by the trade and the consumer. And uh, are the very very important maybe maybe much more important because when you compare a, a agricole rum white or a, a Jamaican or Barbados or to a to a Latin uh, light rum um, you have a great diversity a huge diversity of styles and very easy to understand when these uh, different white rums go to uh, the same kind of bourbon barrel uh, in the same weather of the tropics and for the same, uh, let me say, five years, at the end is normal that the, the aging part of the phase of the process uh, is, the more, is the most flatting, is the most, uh, <laughs> they are more similar after the aging than before, for sure, because 
they do the same same barrel for same age and same weather. And uh, and another thing is that, as Daniel said, there is a great interest in in white rums because uh, in white sorry white spirits in general. So mezcal or or gin or tequila, um, because uh, these spirits uh, are talking about the producer. So uh, the same raw material and distillation, and these are um, words that are. Uh, uh, appealing for for the trade now because uh, uh, no one sp spoken a lot about that in the last years. So always aging, always barrels, always the age, and uh, the wh white rums can be also good for bartenders, good for um, for for rotation. So for for the business, let me say also for margins because these are cheaper than than old rums for the producer. And so they can they can uh, they can do some some more margins, and uh, that's why these white spirits are are going very well, and uh, they they the value maybe is the artisanal the handcraft, so mezcal, uh, artisanal gin, artisanal tequila, and probably also the, the new value of rum is the. The handcraft ram artisan, a small producer, the history of the producer, uh, much more than a, a cold number. I mean, on label. That, that's yeah. I think. Yeah, I think I think as a as a wrap up, I think that my my main conclusion would be that I think that we all agree that aging, uh, you know, the interaction of the spirit with the wood obviously adds um, character, adds. Uh, balance and sometimes, you know, but it isn't the ultimate uh, yeah. element of quality. And there are other elements that have to be uh, communicated as well. And maybe that's where uh, we can contribute to communicating to consumers that there are, you know, the, the culture of the country, the production processes, the, the raw materials, all of these together make the quality of the product, not just the financial element. So, I thank you guys very, very much. Uh, it's been a pleasure as always. Um, these guys are going to be uh, continuing their rum education, so check it out in, in uh, acr-rum.com. You can uh, look to see where the sessions are taking place. Um, and we'll be back in about a month's time talking more rum, and uh, maybe I'll get it right uh, where you guys are that uh, next time. But I uh, thank you, thank you very, very much, and uh, I'll see you soon. Thank you, thank you. Thank you.